Hey everyone, I'm Shrenu, and I'm a software engineer here at Eventual. I primarily work on Daft, particularly the execution side of it. And in the past, we've done videos about different aspects of Daft. This time, I wanted to do something a little different and talk about a problem that we've been looking into thoroughly here. And that's related to GPU execution and what we can do to make that more seamless. Why is that important? Why is that something we're even like looking into? Well, we've noticed that a lot of multimodal data processing pipelines involve some degree of machine learning in the process. Whether you're working with images or documents or PDFs or something in that vein, you're probably going to do something like making embeddings or classification or some sort of like generation inference. And you have two options to do these three things. Either one, you call a remote API like from OpenAI to do it for you, or two, you host a model yourself and you run that aspect in it. And that means you're probably going to use PyTorch and you're probably going to need a GPU for that to run pretty quickly. And so what does that look like in DAF right now? Well, it probably breaks down into, like, into these five steps. You first start with reading from some source with metadata about your corpus, whether that's like URLs or additional information. You then take those URLs and do a download to actually get the documents in memory, something like that. Then you do some degree of pre-processing to transform them whether with images that would probably be cropping and maybe like grayscaling or resizing. With documents, it might be tokenization. Then we actually do the important part, in this case, embeddings. And right now, you would probably write that as a pretty big Daft UDF with a PyTorch model inside where you call model.eval. Then from that, you probably get your embedding. And then you can take that and write that to wherever you want to write it to, whether that's a vector database like TurboPuffer or to Parquet. And that makes sense. And you know, Daft can basically manage this entire process for you by having multiple execution agents like this, going through each one of these steps for a source and just kind of piping through the entire pipeline. The big problem, though, is step four. That's the one where we're just jumping into plain Python. And that can lead to some interesting behavior. Let's actually talk about like, what's going on in step four. So I'm going to draw a diagram of a computer, a very simplified model, that we can talk about. So we got our CPU, where the main execution side of Daft, the whole async runtime, basically lives there. It's connected in some sort of lane, probably like PCIe or something. And you probably have a network card that allows you to connect to external sources, let's say S3. You also have memory. And in our case, somewhere all the way on this side, you probably have your GPU. So when we're running through these first couple of steps, let's say like read source, Daft is sending a request through the network to get some data, metadata. And with URL download, it's doing the same thing. It's loading from probably S3, your image, and saving that into memory. Then it does pre-processing between memory and the CPU. And once it reaches the embedding step, you probably do three things. One, you probably do a what we like to call a host to device transfer. In this case, host usually refers to the CPU. The device is the GPU. All that basically means is we transfer the item from main memory into the GPU because it has its own virtual memory, VRAM. Then we do the actual model execution, taking that image and turning it into an embedding. And then we bring it out via a device to host transfer, moving it back. And at this point, Daft can then take that embedding and write it out somewhere. That makes sense for the most part. But notice one thing. If we had multiple images, like we have here, that we have in memory, and we're trying to do some sort of processing with both of them, we're stuck in a sequential situation, a situation where we have to process one, 
wait for it to get a response, get that response out before we can send the next request. That seems kind of inefficient because in this process, the GPU is basically doing things on its own pretty independently. On the DAP side, we're not actually like sending any requests or setting up any work. We're just basically saying to the GPU, here's a piece of code, a kernel that we want you to execute. Here's the memory that we want you to use. And here's where we want you to write out. Just go ahead and do it for you. And so in a way, you can kind of think of it like network requests, where we have some external source, and we're requesting for something, and we're waiting for a response. The GPU is basically like a remote server, except that server is just right next to you. And in that vein, what if we, instead of a regular UDF, we had something like a async UDF? Idea there is while Daft can set up a request to say, hey, process this image of the dog, and behind the scenes, it can start preparing the next image such that once it receives, oh shoot, <laughs> once it get, receives the embedding out, it can send the next one. Or even better, it can send multiple at the same time. So when we tested something like this on a like, kind of messy setup, we're cleaning it up right now, we noticed that uh, this term GPU utilization went up a little bit more because of this. Uh, GPU utilization is not the, the best term to use. Uh, it doesn't mean exactly what we thought it meant. Uh, what GPU utilization means is, is the GPU doing any amount of work? Anything? Is it just like given something and is it on, basically? And so it's, honestly, it should be treated like a number between one to uh, between zero and one, like true or false. But for some reason we represent it as like a percentage. So that was a little confusing. But we could see that with this flow, because we're uh, preparing data beforehand and essentially pipelining more of the work throughout the entire process, we're able to increase utilization up even further. There are some gaps though, unfortunately. So with some data types, this works better. And with other data types, it doesn't work as well. Basically, the balance of work between steps like one and three and five and step four needs to be like pretty even. So we decided to go one level deeper and figure out what can we do to make this even better. And this led us to this idea of CUDA streams. What is a stream? So we were talking about how uh, we were basically like scheduling work onto the GPU. W what does that actually mean? Well, we can, a GPU has a concept of a stream, which is basically just a queue of tasks that it needs to perform. And all it knows is that it just needs to perform those tasks in the order they appear in the queue. So with something like this, if we said that for each one of these images, we need to do the, the memory transfer, and we need to do like some operator, and then some other operator, and then transfer back. And we had the exact same thing for the other image. This would be kind of like a set of operations that all depend on each other. So we have to do this step first, then this, then this, then this. And if we submitted both of these requests to do these things onto the GPU, well, what would happen is it would receive something kind of like this. and so on. And it would try to start executing this in the order that they arrived. So it would do this one first, wait for this to finish, and then do the second one, and then do the third one, and so on. And that's, that kind of like loses the benefit that we got before with async execution. So how do we solve this issue? It turns out that this is happening because with a single process, with something like Daft, which is running on one process in your machine, it assumes that every operation that comes in should be done in the order that it comes in, which is not exactly what we want. We want to kind of treat these two things as independent pipelines. And so you can use uh, CUDA streams, which is implemented in PyTorch via nice Python APIs, to split these into se two separate things. And so rather than having like one queue, you can have two separate queues. And it can start doing those queues in like different orders. So it can start with this one and then do this one, and then maybe it chooses to do this one, and then goes back to this one, or something like that. Uh, 
Actually, wait, that made no sense. <laughs> no, no, that, that does make sense. <laughs> yeah, no, the, okay, I just, I just said this part poorly. Yeah, because this is like one stream of operations that is trying to perform, and it's just fixed to the order that is defined in, this, in the list. Well, with this one, it's not beholden to, to that list. It has to follow each of these individual streams, but it, it can jump between streams whenever it wants. And the even nicer thing is GPUs are not exactly a monolith. They actually have like components inside of them. And so uh, it's not just like this blob <laughs> right here that can just do one of these things. There's actually pieces inside of it. For our purposes, let's say that it's broken apart into three pieces. This like H2 device, host to device executor, and then a device to host executor. And these two things are specialized to do these operations only. And they can't do these in between operations. The rest of the GPU can do like the, the middle stuff. And so that means that at any like single point of time, you can have the GPU doing like this step, and then it can also be doing this step, and it can also be doing like this step, assuming that the like previous ones were already done. And so there's these diagrams called like throughput diagrams that we can normally look at to see how what's happening. And so if you kind of think about it as like three different timelines for these three parts of the machine of the GPU or of the hardware. Our goal is rather than doing like steps one by one waiting on each other, we want to basically have each piece doing working at like 100% all the time. A single image would still require that it does step one, step two, step three in that order. And so each one wouldn't be individually fast, but overall, because everything's kind of like packed together, they become fast in aggregation. And so we'll see like that GPU utilization doesn't actually go up higher, which is why it's not a great term, but our overall runtime of our pipeline gets better. So yay, that's, that's even better. Are we done? Well, <laughs> we're never done. So what else can we do? <laughs> We noticed that some models for some data types, like with images, can be pretty hefty. So, in a, so this diagram doesn't end up looking as pretty as it looks like here. The execution portion ends up being like really big. And modern GPUs, like the like A100s and so on, they have more like individual executors, and even the executors themselves are like blocks that are broken apart with individual threads, and that can get like pretty complicated. But when you have a fairly big model, it to, takes up a significant amount of space. And so we were wondering, okay, like what else can we kind of do in between? In addition, we also noticed that, uh, um, that we were putting out like more overhead on the DAF side. And we wanted to see if we could reduce that down so that we had more time to do the other steps. That led us to investigating what actually happens in the hosted device transfer and then the device to host transfer. And so what actually happens with those parts? Let's erase this. So I talked about memory as like this box, this box with a bad M, but it's a lot more interesting than that. You can almost think about it like a grid of spaces. We haven't really talked about the operating system and all of this, the one that's kind of supposed to be managing a lot of this hardware. And that's because it's like kind of isolated. It's kind of split off. It focuses on this aspect. And then uh, most GPUs have their own uh, firmware that's handling that part. That's a driver that's connected. But it acts mostly independently. One thing that operating systems do that's great for the most part is they do something called virtual memory addressing. They basically just like virtualize all of this complication. If different applications, um, let's say like two versions of Daft, were running at the same time, we don't want them like clobbering each other. Where like the the mini Daft <laughs> is like doing stuff on this side, and then the the big Daft decides, oh, I need all of this, and then overrides each other. That will that will mess stuff up. So the operating system, knowing that this will be a problem for any process in general, will basically hide away the complexity and give each one of these their own impression of memory. That's called like virtual memory. And it will map that to physical memory via these blocks or pages. And it's able to do even more cool things if 
I don't have any space, but if like storage was on this side, it's able to like swap some of these blocks out to storage in like a, in a blob, and that's swap space, if you've heard of that. Uh, yeah, it can get pretty crazy, and applications can do things on their side to make that like even crazier. But I mean, what does this have to do with what we're talking about here? Well, when we're setting up a embed operation and trying to do these three steps, where, as we mentioned before, these execute over here in this guy. And this guy has no idea what's going on over here. And so it can't just, you can't just tell it like, hey, go take my image and copy it to your side because it has no idea where this image is. It could be here, it could be here, you know, uh, because of the mapping, it kind of overlaps. And Daft, as the executor, can't tell it because it only knows the virtual address. It doesn't know the actual location. And so, what we have to do is have a fallback situation. We need to basically tell the OS, hey, I need like a spot in memory that's fixed, that's locked down. Don't move it, don't put it somewhere else, just keep it in that one spot because I need to point to it directly. I'm gonna copy my image into that spot and I'm going to give that spot to the GPU so that it can make its copy into its own memory. Yeah, there. That's, that's expensive, it turns out. Kind of makes sense, because the OS is like trying to do all this fancy stuff, and we're basically getting in the way and said, like, shut up, we, we know what we're doing. Um, and you know, it's not happy about it. But this concept is called pin memory. So if you've ever seen in PyTorch data loader, for example, the term pin memory equals true, this is basically what's happening behind the scenes. So when we're doing this like loop, we're running this for like every set of images, we do we create a pin memory block at both these stages, and then we like get rid of that block right afterwards. That's kind of wasteful. I mean, we're gonna do this like thousands, millions of times. We could just reuse those. And so we've been trying to reuse them create a permanent block and have that lay around so that we don't need to do these steps anymore. We can just copy whatever data comes from the pre-processing step directly and then copy the, uh, the embedding output. And yeah, that helps even more. And so yeah, that's basically where we are on our journey right now. We're still looking into some even more details, stuff about actually execution, if there's ways that we can predict model sizes and make them work a little bit better or maybe map them to the right GPU. Uh, but you know, that's getting into stuff that I, can't I, that I don't necessarily know about right now and you know, come back later about it, maybe. Now, is this stuff that you, as someone who's just trying to write like a pipeline and just wants to get it to work, should be thinking about? Well, our hope is no. Our goal is to like simplify this entire complexity, hide it away, and give you a nice API, maybe like a nicer UDF that just works directly with machine learning stuff, with PyTorch, and lets you do all this magic without you even knowing it. So yeah, keep track of us, pip install daft, play around with it, let us know how you feel. We're gonna come out with some improved versions over time in the coming weeks. If any of this stuff sounded interesting to you, then subscribe to our blog where we'll talk about this in more detail. Otherwise, thanks for watching. See you soon.